channel thank you so much for watching my video i want to ask you for a favor to subscribe and support a small channel like mine to make more tutorial videos i have changed my personal channel to unique tech same name because i write tutorials for unique tech which has a lot of free great tutorials on medium and this video is a companion video for the psyche and learn cheat sheet article today we want to introduce to you basic patterns to learn when you get started with psyche and learn psyche and learn is a classical machine learning library it's a little different from tensorflow and pytorch which are deep learning libraries so you got the classical which is like xgboost um, um, bayesian classification and uh, any kind of trees decision trees ensemble learning um ada boost you know all, all that stuff and if you're thinking about neural networks and cnn and stuff you might be, have better luck with pytorch and tensorflow um, it's very easy to get started. Um, you can read our article, but sometimes it's just nice to have a voice over to demystify it a little bit. And if you look at the Scikit-Learn documentation, it do, does seem overwhelming at first, but you will notice that if you scroll down um, to, from the function signature, you always see a sample code. And I would always urge you to look at that simultaneously as you read through the documentation because the code usually is just four or five lines you just have to slow down and take a look and it's almost always starting like this from second learn cluster from a, a module import a function or import an entire module together um, and then you will specify some parameters like important parameter for the k-means um, algorithm is number of clusters to initiate and you would initialize the library the initialize the class object um, using this class name and parentheses and passing the parameter um, pattern it's almost always this pattern and you store it in a variable you can call it whatever you want there are a few conventions so we can go over that as well and then you would call that um, call on uh, and then you will you, you can actually simplify this a little bit you can um, call this a model as well and then you call model dot fit it's essentially a chaining and that's that's sort of like psyche learns way to say we're gonna train we're gonna train this model on the input data and you notice that in tensorflow you will see a very, very similar pattern but in PyTorch, usually you have to write your own customized um, training loop. It's like more functional and the TensorFlow felt like a more high level a API sometimes. And finally, um, you call predict. It's model.predict. That is, you, you sort of see the two important tasks in machine learning. One is training and one is prediction. It's almost always like this, and we can see a few more examples. And one of, one of the things to pay attention to is when you read that example and look at the import statement, it gives you a hint of what portion of the scikit-learn library you're looking at. For example, the label encoder, which is great for data transformation, for categorical data, for data processing, data cleaning, um, it comes from the pre-processing library. And sometimes you will notice that even our tutorial could be potentially out of date because um, scikit-learn is such a great library. It keeps improving, keeps renaming, keeps uh, reviewing their hierarchy. So sometimes you will notice the um, maybe, you know, here... Um, they may change it or people may shorten it um, but in general I think overall the second library try to make it consistent so this is probably our tutorial being out of date then there's um, we we should have uh, have a header here probably um, 
And then you can see the main max scalar also comes from the preprocessing library. I think that's really cool because um, it gives you a hint whether you're importing a model, an uh, ensemble method, or preprocessing method. It's kind of helpful. And that's how I, you know, see it. That's my little tip. And sometimes the documentation can be overwhelming. If you slow down, you can also see um, it might give you the exact formula, how it is calculated. So I think when I was working with students who was learning machine learning from me, I've noticed sometimes we get confused a little bit about what's a scalar doing, what's a normalizer doing. And what's nice is that the documentation actually spell out the formula for you. Uh, perhaps the most useful thing is train and test split. It's almost always this pattern, just pa pretty much uh, familiarize yourself with it and potentially get used to it. It's always a tuple of four items. Um, sometimes it could be tuple of two, I think, in, uh, in some API setting. But generally, you will see four um, outputs come from train and test split. I think the newest API, I'm just going to venture to say four is the safest. Um, and it's always um, the train, the test, and the, of the features, and then the train and the test of the labels. So you can see big X is specified that way on purpose because the feature is usually a feature matrix. So we use capitalized letter to denote a matrix. And um, the output, the label is usually a vector, so we use small y. And you almost always see the pattern. And again, you also see the import statement initialization with parameters specified. And then the output gets assigned to four, a tuple of four variables. Cool. And then, um, when we read the documentation, um, it can be a little tough, but I, what I usually do is to just, I, I really think it's a great documentation, but just sometimes it does take a while to familiarize myself with the pattern. I just take it one thing at a time. For example, for the imputer, I think the most important pattern, uh, important parameter is the strategy. So I try to read up on that slowly. And earlier we we're talking about, you notice that when I'm trying to import a scoring function, um, I'm actually pulling from the metrics module rather than earlier the preprocessing. And the grid search CV cross validations from grid search, uh, model selection, etc. And again, I think they're trying to consolidate the API. Um, I think model selection might work for both. And it will, you would get an error. If you get an error, it's not like I don't know this. I just I think it's, I would like to point out that I've seen this error many times, even as I'm working through different versions of Scikit-Learn over the years, um, is that you get a, um, you learn from the API documentation or someone's tutorial, and you get this error, it's like so-and-so module is not found. And that's usually because of the API keeps improving and consolidating. It might just be under a different module now and under a different hierarchy. So just uh, stack overflow it, Google around, and and see what happened. Um, so, so I would like to reiterate the most important pattern is the import uh, initializing the class name with parameters, call the fit to train, the dot fit method to train, and call the dot predict method to uh, make prediction. And you can also see the score. Score usually takes a, um, so we, we can definitely Google that in just a second. Real quick, a lot of people didn't know that um, there is a roadmap for selecting, making selections in Scikit-learn, you can select your models. And that is, you know, as neural networks become more important, this might be less, more academic, like more occurring in, in the process when you're studying this in university. But there is a roadmap, it's kind of helpful. You can see how to make decision depends on your sample size, etc. So let's just Google super quick on Scikit-learn documentation. 
um, scoring function and I, I'll chain it together and just show you what I was talking about when I said the documentation is good so so there are a few kinds of documentations in scikit-learn there's these kind of more uh, comprehensive and more cohesive documentation that just explains in general how to approach this subtask and then once you click into the function such as f1 score you will get the function api in details um, which ones are required, which ones are optional, a little brief description. And earlier I mentioned the formula will be specified here. And this is really helpful um, in this, you know, greatly simplify and save you some time to go Google and find it on Wikipedia and then translate a very complex looking formula into code. And it's really right here. And then it goes into function signature. So sometimes why true and why pred, um, this I just kind of quickly read up on the two most important parameter and this is a pattern here too we didn't have that in the article maybe you should add that and this article uh, this part is um, the scoring function usually takes in first the true prediction what the y label should be and then it takes in the, uh, the, the true label and then it takes in the prediction that your model generated. It's almost often, I, I would like to venture to say, it's usually in that order, and it's important to not switch them. Um, cool. And finally, you scroll all the way down to see the sample code. And this sample code is very useful. You can, I often copy and paste and just test it out. And usually, Another important thing to realize is when you read the sample code, this is a pro tip here, um, they do a very good job creating a, what's called a fake data, like a play data, um, just to show you what the data could look like, just to simulate um, real quick. Um, so they uh, saying the true label should be 012, 012, but the label predicted as uh, um, predicted by this hypothetical fake model is 021001 and you can see it's got a couple of errors. This is not a strict accuracy scoring so you're not going to see the error like being represented one by one um, but um, we'll see that it can it's pretty intuitive that the score would show you. Um, uh, so first of all uh, you can see um, there are different averages. It's kind of kind of hinting at you if you select different averaging parameter and you can, it's very useful once you have a question about that, you can go read about it. It's a string and then it's a, a this parameter, parameter is required for multi-class labels. So, which is useful. We have more than a, a few classes here, right? So. Um, and here you can see that depends on the parameter you choose, the result is slightly different. And that's one of the arts of doing machine learning is choosing this kind of hyperparameters. So it should it demonstrate that. And here is saying, uh, average could be none. Um, and usually I just go back and read like, what does it mean by none? You're saying either binary, micro, macro, weighted, calculated metric for each label is required. If none, the scoring for each classes are returned. Otherwise, it determines the type of averaging performed in the data. So since we said none in this last one, you can see instead of just one scalar, it returned three. Uh, returned the three numbers. A vector of three. So in here, um, if it's all zero, um, zero division is another parameter you can specify. So I won't go into details for it, but that's what I mean. Like initially, it looks really overwhelming, but there's quite a cool pattern to follow, and it's uh, one of the cleanest documentations out there. So I hope you really enjoy using second learn and um, stuff like the. Um, stuff like um, 
where we see the um, train test split is really used very often in all of machine learning and not just classical machine learning. So enjoy. Please subscribe and support the channel. I really appreciate your help and it helps me a supporting small channel less than mine. I can grow and I can produce better and more uh, quality tutorial videos. Thank you so much.